Well, good morning to you all. If you have your Bibles with you, please do keep it open at John's Gospel, chapter 10. Uh, we did have others uh, in the series where we we're looking through John's Gospel as well, and you're welcome to uh, go look at that uh, on our YouTube channel, SAPCKL, and you can follow uh, from our previous uh, sermons on John 10. Well, let's just spend a moment. We'll just uh, ask God for his help as we seek to understand his word afresh. Let's just pray together first. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, let your gospel come on to us, not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with much assurance that with humble, teachable, and obedient hearts, we may receive what you have revealed and do always what you have commanded. And we ask all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, 2024 is going to be the biggest election year ever in human history. I wonder whether you knew that. More than 60 countries and estimated 4 billion people, around half of the entire planet's population, will be going to the polls this year to choose their leader. And this has never happened before in a single year, ever. So 2024 is going to be a highly consequential year for humanity, people in India, in Pakistan, in the United States, in Indonesia, in Taiwan, in South Africa, in Mexico, and so forth, they will all be voting for who will lead their nations, and in turn, what direction their country will go in the years ahead. Question is, is after this year, will there be more social freedoms? Will there be more economic growth, or more political accountability, or will there be more autocracy? more corruption, more fake news, more inequalities. You see, friends, who wields power matters, and who we choose to follow also matters a lot. Consider, for example, in this slide, a, a photo, uh, a night photo of the Korean Peninsula. If you can have the slide up, please. The question is, what do you see in this photo? Well, the bright clusters of light in the very center of the picture, that bright cluster there, that's South Korea. The other bright cluster at the bottom left of the photo is Shanghai, China. And on the right, you see that uh, sort of like um, a long, elongated cluster of light? That's the island of Japan. But there's only another area in the very center of the photo that only has one dot of light in the entire country. And that country is North Korea. What do you see? Well, on the one hand, we can see the economic disparity between the North and South. One country in the South is literally bathed in electricity with cities glowing in the dark. The other is shrouded almost entirely in darkness, a sign of its lack of progress across the entire country. But if we look deeper, we might also see that who wields power matters. You see, since 1945, after World War II, the, when the Korean Peninsula was split into two, South Korea has had 13 different presidents. But North Korea, on the other hand, have had only three since 1945. Grandfather, son, grandson, all from the same family. So what do you see? Well, both Koreas started at the same level at the same time, but almost 80 years later, the gulf between the two today is a vast chasm. Why? Who wields power and who we choose to follow matters. It matters a lot. Thank you. Thanks for the slide. And this is what our text is about today. You see, there are two groups of people that will be available for us to follow. But who should we follow? What should we be looking for? Who can we trust to have our best interests at heart? And three key truths can guide us from our text today. And that's what we're going to look at. The first thing in verses 1 to 6 is that we'll find that not every leader is worth following. But in verses 7 to 10, we'll see that access to the good life that we actually desire can only be found through Jesus. And we can trust this Jesus, verses 11 to 18, because he is willing to give his all for us. So we're going to look at that in turn in a moment. But first, I just want to step back for a moment and to consider where this text in John 10 fits in into the wider narrative. This text, of course, has two of the seven I am sayings in the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John, of course, is an eyewitness account of Jesus' life and teachings. 
Jesus says, I am sayings, I am the gate, I am the light, I am so forth. They are a series of self-revealing discourse to explain who he is. In essence, they're trying to answer the question, what do you see when you look at Jesus? He says, I am this, I am that. And the two I am sayings here actually follow on from what happened earlier in John chapter 9. There, the religious leaders in Jesus' time, the Pharisees, they were actually unhappy that a man who was a blind beggar could now see. And this was an extraordinary miracle, of course, a tremendous blessing. But why were they so unhappy? Well, the man had said that Jesus healed him on a Sabbath day, no less. So what the Pharisees saw when they looked at Jesus was Jesus a sinner, Jesus a deceiver, a false prophet. Why? Well, in their minds, they're thinking, well, how can a true man of God not obey what God commanded? How can a true prophet of God work on a Sabbath forbidden by God himself? So the more the man credited Jesus for doing this good work, the angrier the religious leaders became. So much so, if you look back a few verses in John 9, verse 34, they scolded the man. They said, you were steeped in sin from birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. They threw him out from the synagogue. How dare you, in, in effect, they're saying, how dare you, an ordinary man, an unholy man, a layman, tell us, the religious leaders, guardians of faith, who we should follow. And they threw him out of the synagogue, the very place where the man was supposed to find God, to meet with God. The man who received his sight by a miracle from God was rejected by the religious leaders who couldn't see God at work in his life. They refused to see the healed man for what God did. Now, it's that dispute that led to our text today. You see, here's the question. What do you see when you look at this Jesus? What do you see when you look at these other religious leaders? Is Jesus a man from God or is he a scammer? Is he a sinner? Is he a demon-influenced false prophet, a cult leader? That's what some people saw in verses 19 to 21. You see that dispute at the end of this uh, discourse. You know, should we follow this resume-thin Jesus? You know, what has he got to show for himself? Or should we follow instead the religious establishment who currently sit in positions of influence and power, accepted and respected by their peers. And so let's have a look at the text uh, today from John's Gospel, chapter 10. Not every leader is worth following. We see that in verses 1 to 6. Just because someone currently holds institutional power doesn't mean they're worth following. And Jesus uses this sheep-shepherd metaphor to make his point. And this metaphor is actually quite a familiar sight in their daily life as well as an image with significant biblical overtones. Now, my guess is that many of us are not shepherds. I, I think that's probably a good guess. So I'm going to show you a picture of what it is in their mind's eye, what the sheep pen or the sheepfold is like in Jesus' time. The sheep pen is a large enclosure. It's made from rocks out in the field. And what happens is, some, oftentimes, several families might keep their sheep together. So several families would share in this. And the shepherd, or sometimes the hired hand, they would stand guard at night by the gate. And you see that, the man sitting down by the gate there. And so when the time came for feeding, the shepherd would come and would call out to the sheep who are his. And so the sheep would recognize the shepherd's voice, because remember, there are a few families here that are sharing this. They would call out, the sheep would recognize his voice, and they would trot out and they would follow him to green pastures and waters. Now that's the sheep pen in daily life. Thanks for the photo. But the shepherd imagery was also used repeatedly in the Old Testament as a metaphor for Israel, Old Testament Israel's leaders. Most significantly here for us is Ezekiel chapter 34. And Ezekiel was written about 600 years roughly before Jesus' time. And there God had rebuked Israel's leaders for being concerned only about themselves and not the people they lead. They had used the sheep to enrich themselves, to make themselves look good. They ruled over them roughly. They didn't care for their well-being. So you see that in a slide, Ezekiel 34, the condemnation that the prophet, that God said through the prophet, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you, shepherds of Israel. You see, it's a, it's a metaphor that's been used 600 years before Jesus, who care only for yourselves. 
Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have, brought, you have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You ruled them harshly and brutally, and they were scattered. They became food for all the wild animals. So what would God do? Well, God's answer, you can see that in the next slide in Ezekiel 34, is that God will shepherd them personally. So we see the next slide. See how many times the phrase, I will occur. So this is now God talking. For, I, for this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Remember, the shepherds of Israel were not doing what they were supposed to, so this is the response. God says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered. I will bring them out from the nations. I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains. I will tend them in good pastures. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. I will shepherd the flock with justice. See, God will do it personally. God will step in. And this is what we see in John chapter 10. See, there are two kinds of leaders available to them and to us. One will be the true shepherd. He is the true owner. He has proper access. He knows his sheep personally. And that shepherd is God himself in the person of Jesus. The others will be the false shepherds. They have no true concern for them. They just want to use them for selfish gain. They get to the sheep through underhanded means. And Jesus expands upon this metaphor in verses 7 to 10. And here we get to the first of the two I am sayings. I am, in verse 7, I am the gate for the sheep. Now remember that picture of the sheep pen and you have the shepherds sitting by the gate. What does this mean? Well, gates is about access, access to the sheep pen, access to pasture. Who gets to come in? Who gets to go out? And Jesus says he is the gate. He's not a gate, not one of many gates, but the gate, which means access is through him alone. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because we have to be careful who you choose to follow. Now, what are you looking for in life? And where do you hope to find it? Where might your path that you're currently traveling on, your path in life, where do you think it might lead you if it is not through Jesus, the gate? You see, Jesus tells us where his gate will lead us to, and you see that in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, see, if you pass through Jesus, the gate, he says, whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out, and find pasture. Verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You see, what Jesus offers access to, in effect, is what we most need and want in life. How so? Well, we want rescue from our troubles. We want forgiveness for sins, for mistakes. We want peace and security. We want our needs met. And above all, we want life. We want much more of it. This is what Jesus promises in this metaphor. You will be saved. You will find pastures. And you will have life to the full. Now, isn't that what everyone is looking for? Live long enough. And we will have troubles. Health troubles. Relationship troubles. Financial troubles. But at its heart, the Bible says, the root cause of it all is our spiritual trouble. You see, friends, the Bible, in effect, says we are spiritual orphans living in a fallen world. That's why we have all these troubles. There's no one to watch out for you because you're a spiritual orphan. And the world is hostile towards you because it's a fallen world. We're spiritual orphans in a fallen world. We need to be saved. We need someone to watch over us. We need someone to guide us and protect us and provide for us. And we want not just to have a long life, but we actually what we really want is a full life, a life filled with love and laughter and peace and abundance. We don't just want to live a long life for the sake of longevity alone. We don't want to be bedridden, attached to tubes and machines just to survive. No, we need health span, not just life span, health span physically. We relationally, financially, but above all, spiritually. And the question is, where do you think you can find this? Where do you think 
you can find this. Which paths are you following in life to get you this? Because actually, what's happening is that those are the things you are really looking for. Where are you devoting much of your time and energy towards in your daily life? You see, it matters who we follow. Because not every path will lead to the same ends. In contrast to Jesus, false shepherds will never lead their sheep. In verse 8, it says, instead they come to steal it. To steal means to take away from someone else's work. Plus, false shepherds, what the false shepherds do is never for the sheep's good. And you see that in verse 10, they come to exploit, abuse the sheep for their selfish gain. But how can we trust this Jesus to give us what we most want and what we most need? And we see that in verses 11 to 18. We can trust this Jesus because he is willing to give us his all for our good. Because Jesus alone, among all others who might claim to be gods or prophets in history, only Jesus alone, amongst all religions, is saying that he is willing to give his all for our sake, for our good. And you see in the next slide, this is emphasized in verses 11 to 18. You see, five times Jesus says here, he is willing to die for his sheep. In verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Verse 18, he says it twice. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. You see, five times he mentions that he underlines this again and again. And he did indeed die on the cross for our sakes. You see that if you just flip a few chapters down to John chapter 19. And the question is, what other religious leaders has ever done this? And that is why Jesus is the good shepherd. You see, false shepherds want their sheep to die for them, to sacrifice for them. But the true shepherd is willing to die to self for the sake of his sheep. False shepherds want the sheep to die for them, to sacrifice for them. The true shepherd is willing to die to self for the sake of his sheep. What does it look like? They're willing to endure hardship. They're willing to sacrifice time and money and reputation and honor, all for the sake of the good of the people that God has entrusted to them. And all of this is not just a metaphor for Jesus. He actually did this. His crucifixion in Jerusalem under the Roman governor Pilate, that's an undisputed historical fact, accepted by both religious and secular scholars alike. So here's the question again. What do you see when you look at Jesus? Who are you following? Is that religious leader that you're following, are they willing to die for you or are they merely demanding that you die for them instead? That you sacrifice for them. What Jesus said here not only points to his death, however, but also to his resurrection as well. You'll find that in the Bible narrative, these two events are inseparable. It never just talks about his death, his crucifixion in isolation. Jesus' dying and rising are bound up together and you see that in verses 17 and 18. See, not only the Jesus, will Jesus voluntarily lay down his life, it also says he will take it up again. He will take it up again. Jesus had to die so that we don't have to. That's, that's the Bible narrative. That's the, that's the point of view. Death. Death is a physical and spiritual separation from God. Death is the eternal punishment for our sins. But Jesus says his death can pay for it all. How can we be sure? We can be sure because the Bible says he rose again from the dead. He took up his own life again after he had laid it down. We can see how the Apostle Paul talks about this in the next slide in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, it says, but also for us, he's talking about Abraham credited to him for righteousness, to whom God will credit righteousness. It says, for us who believe in him, for the church, for us who believe in him, who raised uh, Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. So his rising from the dead is not just to show off his power, but it's also for our justification, for us to be made right with God. 
It means that his resurrection means, when we look at his resurrection, it means that our sins have been paid in full. When he says he will take up his life again, how so? Well, imagine, thanks for the slide, imagine um, someone uh, gets to eat at a Michelin-star restaurant, for example, and racks up a gigantic bill, and they couldn't pay it. <coughs> what happens? Well, usually they're not allowed to leave until the bill is settled, isn't it? Or someone is arrested for some wrongdoing, what happens? Again, they're not allowed to leave until they can post bail or their penalty is paid in full. And this is the significance of Jesus rising from the dead. You see, the Bible tells us again and again that the wages of sin is death. That means that is what we need to pay to God. That is what we owe to God for our sins, our life. But Jesus lays it down for us, lays down his life for us. So he paid a penalty for us. He died so that we don't have to. But how do we know that his death is enough to pay for your sins and mine? Well, it's because he rose up again. In other words, death couldn't keep him imprisoned. He is free to walk away from the clutches of death. Like a person in the restaurant or the person in prison, they are free to go. They are free to leave. When? When the bill or when the penalty has been paid in full. That's why Jesus can walk away from death. Because the sins have been paid in full. And that is why we can trust Jesus to be our shepherd, to follow him. He has been willing to and he has given his life for our sakes, for our good. And because he rose again, he proves that he can make good on his promises. What other God? Who else can claim to do this for you? Now, what should we make of what Jesus said today? And of course, we, we can see from verses 19 to 21, it's a disputed fact, isn't it? Even in Jesus' time. But for us, it depends on whether you are a shepherd or a sheep today. You see, what Jesus did, he also asked for all those he called to lead and serve his people. And you can be a call to be an under-shepherd in various capacities in the life of the church. We see this imagery carried forward by the Apostle Peter. You can see that in the next slide. In 1 Peter chapter 5, there the Apostle Peter writes to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness to Christ's sufferings. And see the imagery that he carries forward? Be shepherds of God's flock. He's talking to those who serve in some kind of leadership capacity over others that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusting to you, but being examples to the flock, as when the chief shepherd appears, which is Jesus. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade. And so you see this principle of self-giving leadership commanded and modeled by the chief shepherd is relevant to all who serve in the church, who are all who are entrusted to care for the Lord's people, whether they are young or old, whether it's a, a child, a five-year-old, a youth, or someone older, whether it's men or women, whether it's local or internationals. The good shepherd today continues to call out for more under-shepherds to watch over his flock. And we too are to strive to follow in the chief shepherd's footsteps, to be willing and eager to serve, to not do it selfishly, to not lord over his people, to be good examples. What kind of examples? When you can see the Apostle Paul helps us again when he writes to Timothy, his protege. He says, well, set an example for believers in speech. Set an example for believers in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Well, can, we, can others see, if those who are leaders, called to be leaders, can others see you dying to self from your speech? From your self-restraint? Can they see your self-giving leadership from your conduct? That you are someone who love, loves God's church and is willing to lay down your life for the sake of the sheep? Or will they see you magnifying yourself, glorifying yourself from your speech? See your self-centeredness from your conduct. That you are someone who loves yourself and demands others to lay down their life for you. You see, this self-giving leadership is not just limited to the church, actually. You see, you see this principle get 
you know, get reflected in a microcosm model in our families as well. Again, the Apostle Paul, for example, when he writes uh, to husbands and wives, Ephesians chapter 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. You see, this whole idea of giving yourself up, that's exactly what the great shepherd, the good shepherd did. Gave himself up, laid down his life. Now you note the two phrases, gave himself up for her, it's as if you are the good shepherd, but it's for the purpose to make her holy, which is for her spiritual good. But this dying to self, this self-giving sacrifice, is not just demanded from him, it's also demanded from her. It just looks differently. You see that Paul then writes, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, as the church submits to Christ. You see, why do I say that? It's because, you see, to submit, actually, it's a kind of dying to yourself isn't it? To submit is a kind of dying to yourself for the sake of the other. Because to submit means you're ready to relinquish your rights, to relinquish your demands, to relinquish, let go of your desires for the sake of the other. So in one sense, both husband and wives are required to give of themselves for the sake of the other. In some way, it's just express itself differently. That's why Paul prefaces this whole section in verse 21, Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, but it just looks differently. But this kind of dying to self in both the church and in the home is not easy to do. It's not. It's not a natural thing to do. So, so it's, it would be incomplete to say, this is the law, you do it. No, it's hard to do. Why? Well, here's the bottom line because we are not yet perfect spiritual people, isn't it? We're not yet perfect. We still struggle. Even the Apostle Paul himself still struggle. And we need inward help from God the Spirit through prayer to be transformed inwardly, to, to practice this kind of self-giving love and sacrifice. But we also need outward help from the church community, from other believers through accountable community. Now, of course, in another sense, every believer, not every believer is going to be an under-shepherd, but every believer will be a sheep in the presence of Jesus, the chief shepherd. But we should note that we're not the only ones. The people here, you're not the only sheep. I have other sheep, Jesus says in verse 16, that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now here in John 10, Jesus was referring to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. But actually for us today, we should also be mindful to welcome other sheep into our community from every tongue and nation and tribe. But how should we do it? What should sheep do above all? Well, from John 10, this is what sheep, all sheep should do. Listen to his voice. Verse 4. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. Now here's the question for you to reflect on. Have you heard his voice lately? Or has his voice become a faint, distant echo? Friends, for the lost and wandering sheep, do you know that he continues to look out for you? Jesus, the great shepherd. He continues to look out for the lost wandering sheep, calling out to you by name. Because the Bible says he made you. He made you. Before the creation of the world, he had already thought of you. And he loves you. And he redeemed you by dying for you. And like the father of the prodigal son, he is waiting for you. Come home. Come home to the great shepherd. Well, for the sheep that are comfortable in his pen, perhaps, that's another category of sheep, you're you're just sitting there quite comfortable, uh, munching away. 
Well, do you know that his voice has been preserved? That Jesus' voice has been preserved in written form in the Bible. That's how you hear his voice today. And in fact, God the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, is our silent shepherd today who will lead us and teach us to hear the chief shepherd's voice. You can see that in our next slide in John 16 where Jesus tells his disciples, look, I have much more to say to you. So Jesus, this is like his disciples, they want to hear from him. And Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, God the Holy Spirit, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all of the truth. And he is the one who preserved the scripture. He is the one who inspired it. He is the one who will enable us to understand it. So friends, if you want to hear God's voice, don't wait for that dream. Don't wait for that mystical voice to appear. Don't spend time listening to every other voice in the world today. Pray to God to retune our hearts like the radio station. You're going you're gonna to find the station. You have to tune it. And so pray to God to retune our hearts to hear his voice in the Bible in 2024. Because 2024 is going to be a highly consequential year in human history. Many people will be choosing who they will follow. But the question for us is, what about you? Who will you follow in 2024? Jesus says he is the good shepherd. And so friends, let us resolve to follow him this year. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we confess to you, as the hymn writer says, our hearts are prone to wander, to wander away from the Lord that we love. Forgive us of our weaknesses. Forgive us on how we so easily listen to the many other voices in our lives and rather than to tune our hearts to hear your voice. Open the eyes of our hearts afresh today that we might see that you, the Good Shepherd, will lead us to good things and things that we need and want most in life. That you, the Good Shepherd, is the one that will lead us to the still waters, to the green pastures, to life, and to the life to the full, life in abundance, life beyond this present earthly life. But all that we are longing for can only be found in you. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray that you'll help us to see you afresh. We pray for your spirit to be at work, to draw those uh, that have been wandering back into your presence, to know that you are a God of grace, that you will forgive them, and that you long for them to know you, to hear you, to walk with you again. And for those who are not yet in your sheepfold, we pray that you open their eyes to see that you are the great shepherd and that everyone else don't have their best interests at heart, that no other God has claimed to die for them. And so, Lord, we pray for your spirit to be at work in us this year. Enable us to be your people as you promise you will be our God. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.